In this video, I'm going through every piece of relevant wildlife photography gear that I own and rate them on their usefulness as well as how frequently I use them. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is a phenomenal website platform I've been using for years to show off my work and sell products, but more on them later. Early in my career, I felt confused on what's actually necessary with wildlife photography gear, and even still, I find myself occasionally wanting to get things that I don't need or going too cheap on things that I should have spent more money on. So my goal with this video is to demystify all this and give my best advice on where I think you should spend your money and where I think you're wasting it. I've marked chapters in this video in the description below so that you can skip to which pieces of gear you're interested in learning most about. On a side note, I've also reviewed many other cameras and lenses that won't be talked about in this video, but you can find them in my Beyond the Shot playlist on my channel. But in this video, I'll just be going through the pieces of gear that I personally own, and even more so focus just on each piece of gear as a concept, rather than specifically which lens is sharper than which other lens as an example. So to start off with my main camera that I use for wildlife photography, I'm currently using the Panasonic S1R. If I were to give a recommendation nowadays for a main camera on a decent size budget, it would not be the Panasonic S1R. This is a few years old now, but for the time, it was great priced. I was a manual focus shooter and still primarily am and it has great image quality built into it. So I definitely would recommend other types of cameras around the same price point as this now, but the image quality holds up great. And really this is the camera that I use for most all situations besides low light. This higher megapixel sensor performs really well in a lot of scenarios, but in low light, it definitely struggles more than my secondary camera that I'll get to in a moment. Now, one thing I quick did want to mention is this is a 50 megapixel camera, which at the time was all the hype, and it still kinda is in a way, but if something I've learned over the years is that 50 megapixels is a little bit overrated. It is definitely very helpful in certain scenarios and definitely isn't a downside in most scenarios beyond the low light capabilities. However, I have found over the years as I've tested out many, many more cameras that usually 30 megapixels is plenty good in a lot of scenarios. 24 is even passable in most scenarios. So I just did want to mention that really quick, but this is my main camera. As a secondary camera, and the one that I use specifically for low light scenarios, I'm using the Panasonic S5 II, which you guys are currently watching this video with. With the Panasonic S5 II, I use it primarily just for low light situations. It has phenomenal low light performance. I can shoot up to 25,600 ISO and still feel like I can get some shots, even if they're not the perfect ideal amount of noise in the images. Whereas with my Panasonic S1R, I'm even hesitating when I'm going up to 6,400 ISO, to be honest. So the Panasonic S5 II is just incredible for that. Part of why that is, is because it has a lower megapixel sensor of 24 megapixels. However, when you're in those low light scenarios, it's totally worth sacrificing those megapixels. Also, what I do like about the Panasonic S5 II is it is relatively new, came out about a year ago. And so the autofocus is way more updated on it, very capable and uh, makes it really nice in that way. As a third camera, which is pretty old now, I have the Panasonic G9, which you're watching the second angle on. I mostly just keep it around for, I guess, loner purposes if someone's out in the field with me and occasionally I might use it. At the time, I shot Micro Four Thirds and what I liked about Micro Four Thirds was that it was on a budget. It gave me more zoom for less money and uh, it's still a pretty capable type of camera, especially for beginners. So I like that about the Panasonic G9 and how it was lightweight. And I do still have it around for occasional scenarios and kind of backup use. Now moving into lenses. To start off, I use as my primary lens, the Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter Sport. Now, the reason why I've kind of stayed away from prime lenses in general that are so tight is because for me as a wildlife photography content creator and someone who creates YouTube videos and stories, it's really important for me in moments to be able to get wider shots of scenes with the wildlife in them and then get close up of the wildlife. If I'm restricting myself to like a 400 millimeter or a 600 millimeter prime, in my storytelling and the way that I tell stories, it really doesn't give me as complete of a story to work with. So that's one of the biggest reasons why I choose a zoom lens as my main lens that I use in wildlife photography. However, if you do have the budget and are going for purely more portrait style wildlife photos, obviously a super telephoto prime is going to be your best bet there. But if you're trying to tell a story kind of like I do, you might want something like a zoom. If you're working more on a budget, you probably want something more like a zoom as opposed to a prime. Um, but there's lots of different options around that. 
That's my main workload and my workhorse. Um, now, secondly, you guys have been seeing me use this a lot, but I have the Sigma 135 1.8 Prime, and I've been using this honestly just as much as I've been using the Sigma 150 to 600 as of recently. Now, the reason why this Prime works for me is because it is wider, so I don't feel like I miss out on telling stories of what's going on around the wildlife when I am using it. But when I do incorporate it into photography work, Whew, I am really liking the results of these lenses, or of this lens. You guys can check out a couple videos I've been using it on recently. I have more coming up with this lens I'm gonna be using as well. And really what it does offer is it offers the same kind of focal length, right, as this other lens, but it does it at such a shallow depth of field that it provides for a lot of isolation while still including the scenic elements, which you don't get when you're at 150 on this Sigma over here, because at 150 on this Sigma, I'm shooting at like 5.0 on the f-stop. So I forget how many uh, full stops up it is, but it's something like four stops up from this uh, lens right here, which is a huge difference in terms of depth of field and isolation capabilities. Now, as a third lens that I want to mention here, this is for the Panasonic G9. This is a 100 to 300 millimeter that I carry around for the Panasonic G9, which means that it winds up resulting in a 200 to 600 millimeter focal length. So this is, in a lot of ways, very much the little brother to this type of a lens, but just built for micro four thirds. Now that just about wraps up the lenses that I wanted to talk about, and I'll actually be moving back into talking more about two cameras that I didn't mention before in a moment. But back when I started out wanting to pursue wildlife photography as a, a hobby almost a decade ago and wanted to share my work, I immediately turned to Squarespace as a platform to showcase my portfolio. And I wanted to take a brief moment to talk about them, the sponsor of today's video. Squarespace is incredibly simple to learn and use and formatted very well for the photographer's experience. Their fluid engine provides for a seamless building experience on the website. And even back when I knew nothing about how to build a website, I was able to build one that I liked in just a few hours. Nearly four years ago, I decided to turn my hobby into a passion, and that's when Squarespace showed even more of its capabilities. Since then, you have all followed me as I've used Squarespace to launch an online store of products I've sold throughout the years, or even launch a whole photo competition, all hosted on the Squarespace platform. If you're interested in learning more, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Jeremy Nipe to save 10% off your first purchase in a website or domain. Now heading back into the two cameras that I wanted to talk about earlier. One of them is a DJI Mini Pro 3. Now what I really like about this drone and why you see me carry this around and use this one specifically is that it's so dang compact. And as a wildlife photographer, that's super important to me. I wanna be able to throw it in my bag and not have to worry about it taking up a bunch of space that I could be using for other things like super telephoto lenses and stuff like that when I'm hiking out. It's a pretty dang good camera. Another big pro to this is that you don't need um, the same type of licenses that you need to drive bigger drones or to fly bigger drones, which I really like about that. It makes it a little bit more hassle-free. I also do have the remote controller for it as well. I like this because I don't have to rely on my phone battery being alive. I don't have to rely on other connectivity issues. And this connects just so much easier, has a nice built-in screen. And so I really like my DJI Mini Pro 3 for that reason. Now moving into the next one, I also have a GoPro. You guys have seen me do quite a bit of FPV videos, um, first person view videos with this GoPro. I have a couple of straps that I can attach it to my chest or to my head, to my shoulder. I've used them in a couple different ways. And I have the media kit as well for it. That way I can connect it for live streams, which you guys have seen me do, where I've live streamed out in nature with the GoPro. So um, for those situations, I've used the GoPro. Now, um, both of these as well, I mostly use them for storytelling and for videography, but you can wind up using them as well for uh, photography work. And that's something I hope to do more going forward, especially with the drone. I haven't gotten to do photography work yet with the drone, but someday that is a goal that I have going on in the future. And with the GoPro, you could use it as a very clever like setup angle or even underwater type of shots. Um, something that I might dive into someday, but I haven't necessarily decided to do that yet. Now, moving on from cameras and lenses, we've talked about all the core stuff. We're gonna be going into tripods next. I'm gonna be showing a little bit about the tripods that I use. So number one, my most important piece of tripod gear is this Interel tripod, carbon fiber tripod legs right here that I love. 
And I also have the Movo, uh, I think it's the GH800 gimbal head right here as well. And the reason why I've chosen both of these, the gimbal head, um, in my research that I did at the time when I bought it, it was one of the better ones out there, really nice and fluid. It's never ever after years of owning it, giving me problems with how fluid it is and its movement. It also has safety catches here, which is pretty essential for a gimbal. And um, I've never had a problem with it, never even had to re-grease it up in the many years that I've owned it now. I think I've owned it for about five years. Uh, four years or five years, somewhere around there. So that's uh, been great on the gimbal head. A gimbal head is very useful specifically for wildlife photography. I do use it in wildlife videography as well, but honestly I've been very heavily debating just switching to one of my video heads uh, as well. Um, because when I'm trying to do very smooth panning motions in video work, it doesn't wind up being quite as smooth with a gimbal head. But for photography, I think a gimbal head is much, much easier than a video head for wildlife photography. Now moving to the legs, what I like about these legs, first of all, they're carbon fiber. I promise you it's worth the investment. Those aluminum ones, for some reason, just over time, every one that I've had just winds up not being quite as good if you're able to invest the money into the carbon fiber originally. And also what I like about this one is that uh, it has a little um, twisty knob down here, which is a cup that can adjust the angle of the tripod head sitting above it. Uh, these catches here work well. Everything has worked out pretty well with it. And so I've been pretty happy with the results. But honestly, if you're spending a good amount of money, pretty much all carbon fiber uh, tripod legs that you get will be relatively similar as well as the gimbal heads with maybe a few exceptions. So that's my main piece of wildlife photography tripod gear there. I also recently have received this from uh, Siriu or however you pronounce it. I'm still a little bit unsure. Um, but this one has been a very cool video head to be able to test out and try to use recently. What I like most about this one is this is probably the most sturdy tripod I've honestly ever used, even sturdier than that one. These legs are just built like, uh, I don't know, they're built like tanks. <laughs> and so they've been pretty awesome in, um, so far in just how quality this whole build is. The video head is also pretty smooth, but it is made for a little bit lower weight. So because of that, it hasn't been as great when I've tried it out with my super telephoto lens, but what it does work really well for is my 135 Sigma prime lens and maybe smaller lenses like my micro four thirds one and so on and so forth. So I really like that, but like I said, once again, the tripod legs on this thing are really awesome. In my last video that I made on my main channel, you guys can check that out if you wanna see more on that tripod. Also something else I do like about this one that they included is that um, it's made for a lot of different types of uses. So this bar typically can get in the way if you're trying to be do wildlife photography and get perfectly low to the ground, but they've also given you an attachment that is super easy to put into place. And I didn't actually talk about that in the last video, but you can just put it right in there and now you can get flush down with the ground, just like I would be able to with that tripod, um, my main tripod over there. So I like having the option of either having the neck that's easily and quickly adjustable or the, the small neck that I can get perfectly low to the ground on. Now, moving forward beyond that, um, I did want to mention really quick, because I have occasionally gotten comments on some of my uh, smooth sliding motions in a lot of my shots. I carry around a newer carbon fiber, I think this is a 14 inch slider. And what this does is you put the tripod ball head on top of it or whatever you're using, and it can just very smoothly slide back and forth. This is not really for photography purposes, this is for video purposes really only, but this thing is nice and compact, super easy to throw on the tripod right there, and I really like being able to use that for my video work. Now moving on to other types of carrying gear. This is my cotton carrier. This is a harness that goes over my body, and this is by far the most useful thing I have ever used for carrying camera equipment or cameras around while doing wildlife photography. I've used other types of harnesses and straps. I've never liked something even close to as much as this one right here. What I like most about it is first of all, it's very, very comfortable. Second of all, it can fit under a backpack. So I can uh, have this back and everything fits under the backpack on top of it. So it doesn't stop my backpack usage. And uh, third of all, the safety mechanism that's built in and kind of their patented design with it is very, very effective. Never had a camera drop so far and it just catches it, rests it really nicely right in the slot right here. Or I even have a waist slot for this one that I've, uh, I've got. And um, yeah, 
it just works out really well. So if you're going on especially a lot of hikes and stuff like that, I would highly recommend a cotton carrier as it's probably the most comfortable, useful piece of gear that I've ever gotten uh, besides just an essential camera backpack for carrying stuff out in nature. Also, um, as you can see in other videos that I've uh, used it in, it really takes out that camera within the matter of about two seconds. So it's much more effective. If you need a hands-free experience, it's much more effective for pulling out your camera and using it immediately as opposed to like a backpack, for example. That you have to set down, open it up for 30 seconds, and then you get your camera out and then you take the shots, right? So very, very worthwhile investment right there. Now moving to the other carrying system that I use most is uh, the PGY Tech One Mo 25 liter camera backpack. Now the reason why I've chosen this one is um, I guess very personal to me and to other people might not make a lot of sense. So um, the reason why I've chosen this one is first of all, I love how compact and uh, just very solidly built it is. It is um, a decently priced backpack around, I think it's $220. Um, but what I like most about it is it has handles all over. So you can carry it from any angle, which for me, getting in and out of a car, loading it up somewhere, putting it down on the floor when I'm doing wildlife photography, then wanting to really quick pick it up and run with it. I have handles accessible everywhere and it's so compactly built that I'm not scared about something ripping. Whereas I've had camera backpacks where like the top strap has ripped um, because it's just kind of all sagging um, or it's not as firmly built. So I love that about this one. Also these camera backpack straps tuck in right here, which is a huge thing for me personally. Again, feeding into the compactness of the backpack. Um, this is an expandable pouch here, which I love. So this pouch expands out and you can use it or you can choose to just keep it closed. Um, and so most of the time when I'm out doing wildlife photography, what I do is I throw my camo gear and load it up into there. And then I put it all on when I get to location and then I close that up. That way it's more nice and compact once again. So that's that. And then it has one main camera pouch where you have all the camera separators. I'll open it up really quick and you can load your camera into there, customize it however you want. And I find it to be about the perfect size for what I do. However, if you do have a Super Telephoto Prime specifically, you may find it to be a little bit too small. And so I would say if you shoot with a Super Telephoto Prime, this backpack is probably not the backpack for you, but otherwise it might be uh, the perfect match and perfect fit for you. Now, um, moving on beyond the backpack, Let's move into some other pieces of gear, starting out with um, some sound and audio stuff for those who occasionally might be doing some audio work. So my main uh, microphone that I use to get audio if I'm out in the field of wildlife is this Rode Video Mic Pro. And uh, this one costs around $230. This is the newer version and it runs on a rechargeable battery or you can plug in uh, just you know disposable batteries in a pinch if you run out on your rechargeable. However, it lasts like 12 hours or I, honestly, I think a lot more than that um, on the rechargeable. So you should be plenty fine there. This is incredibly good quality. It also does a pretty good job of noise, noise isolating. And it's also very, I guess on the go friendly as opposed to some other shotgun mics you ha might have uh, that are professional grade. They're not quite as on the go friendly. I can just throw this in my backpack and it's not as easily going to get damaged and it's very compact for on top of my camera um, when I'm out in the field. Now what I use for uh, recording this audio today and recording all my audio out in the field of me talking and even just environmentally is this Hollyland Lark M1 and um, it comes with just this kind of like almost AirPods looking case. You get two uh, transmitters, one receiver. The receiver is currently on the camera back there. I have one transmitter here, one spare in here. Um, this one has a good amount of battery life and the recharging case will give you a full like two sets of recharges, which is pretty awesome. And the quality is pretty dang good on this thing. It does a pretty good job of keeping unwanted noise away, especially white noise um, for a lav mic, a wireless lav mic specifically. Don't have to worry about cords, which is incredibly, incredibly nice when you're out in the field doing wildlife photography. And also it does a pretty good job. I've noticed that even though it blocks out a lot of the white noise when I'm out in the field, I get a lot of bird chirps. So if I'm out somewhere and I'm walking around and I don't have my shotgun mic because I don't want to worry about it that day, this still does a pretty good job of getting bird audio out in the field as long as there's not too many sounds going on around me. So I really like that about this microphone.
Now moving into even some smaller wildlife photography accessories that might be out of sight, out of mind for some of you. Number one, probably most important that I've had saved my life a billion times is this Rocket Air Blaster. This is just for getting dust off of a camera sensor or a camera lens, but man, this thing has saved me a billion times. And I really like this air blower specifically. I've had a couple of other cheaper ones. This one costs about, I think it's $9 or something, which might be double the price of some other air blowers that you get that are handheld like this. But this one is much more powerful, I found, on how strongly it blows out the air. And it's very well built, and I just literally throw it in places all the time and like bend the nose, and it's still never broken. <laughs> so I think it's been plenty worth it, as opposed to some other dust blowers that I've had that have broken and again aren't quite as strong. So I would really recommend this one above any other one if you're to buy one, honestly. It's five more dollars, and you'll probably never have to buy one again. I haven't had to for seven years. So. Pretty solid investment right there. Now, another thing that I wanted to talk about that's super important for cleaning is these camera cleaning wipes right here. Just as essential as being able to blow the dust off, sometimes all the dust doesn't come off or sometimes you get a hair that's just stuck on there. And this is incredibly important for that as well. You can get a bunch of different brands, I'm sure. You can check out my brand that I use and the description is below, but these ones work really well. Never had them scratch a lens, do something like that on accident. Something to keep in mind with camera sensors, you wanna be extra careful because of the oil and grease on your hands. So a lot of times you might either wanna take it in to be done professionally if there's something stuck on your sensor that can't be taken off, or you need to be very careful and get maybe a specific camera sensor cleaning kit if you're going to physically touch it with something. The air blower is obviously different. You can blow your camera sensor all day long with that. So that's those cleaning accessories. Now, something else really important to me is, uh, is obviously having a bunch of spare batteries. I just brought out one as an example and chargers. You want these for out in the field. Uh, these are incredibly important. And um, if you're doing wildlife photography, at least investing into a second battery and making uh, extra sure to be really good about charging them before you leave the house is essential. Although I would even recommend three. I also, I didn't bring it out here today, but I do have a portable charger um, that's really nice, huge I use for camping and overnight things um, that has a solar uh, panel attachment. So maybe I'll include that in the description below as well. But that thing has been really awesome for me too if you guys are interested in things where you need to recharge out in the field overnight over multiple days. Now another essential small accessory, in my opinion, is having Allen wrenches in your bag. I have these ones that uh, fit a bunch of different sizes. And these are incredibly important for when I need to tighten those tripod legs or uh, use an Allen wrench on other things as well. Um, I think it's a, a worthwhile small item that you need to have in your bag, small investment as well, and definitely worth having. And then um, I also have a remote shutter. I don't like using the apps typically as much for cameras. I've used uh, apps for a couple different cameras that, you know, Sony has developed their app or Panasonic has developed their app. But I feel like there's always too much lag when I'm hitting that remote shutter on the app, or maybe it has connectivity issues and it'll chop in and out, or I can't be too far away and I need to be closer than I want when I'm out in the open. It does better in a house, it seems like. But when I'm out in the open, I think the signal just kind of goes all directions, has nowhere to bounce off of. So um, I find a lot of connectivity issues with those apps. So because of that, I do have a wireless designated remote shutter that I do use very rarely, to be honest. So I don't use it that frequently, but um, the times where I have used it, it has been incredibly effective, works perfectly, works like a charm, and has been um, very useful. So that just about wraps up my accessories with the exception of the camo gear that I did not include in this video. Reason being, it was just gonna make this video really long as I have a lot of camo gear specifically, but you can check that out in the description below if you wanna see the video on all my camo gear that I own. I've listed all the gear in the description below with affiliate links so that you can find any of it that I've mentioned. Beyond the gear that's talked about here in this video that I own, you can also find a plethora of reviews that I've done in the past from other cameras and lenses from Sony, OM Systems, Sigma, and more on my Beyond the Shot playlist on my channel or in the end screen here. If this video was helpful for you and you wanna see more videos like this in the future, I'd be honored if you subscribe below and I'll see you guys next time.